Hello everyone, welcome to This Day. It is Tuesday, August 1st. I'm Michael Taylor. Thanks for joining us. We have a great show for you today. We want to get right to it. So we want to talk to uh, from Dr. Patrick Griffith from Memorial Care. He's going to be talking to Bobby Higgins about his career pathway, how he got started as a heart surgeon, and what he does today at the medical center. So we want to stay tuned for that. And I'll be coming back later in the program with a conversation with O'Connor Mortuary about grief and how we handle that, how we process that, and some of the healthy ways that we can move forward after we've suffered a loss in our lives. And we want you to stay informed about something coming up this weekend. This is going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be the Farmer's Market over at the Garden Center, and they're hosting that one. It's going to be Saturday, August 5th from noon, from 9 a.m. to noon. It's free, absolutely free. The event features all sorts of fresh seasonal produce, herbs, flowers. It's going to be coordinated, like I said, from the Garden Center's club, and they are going to be taking cash only on this because all the proceeds from this event are going to go to the Florence Sylvester Senior Center Meals on Wheels program. That's a great cause. You can call 949-597-4659 for more information. Uh, there are going to be bus routes and transportation to the center, so go out there and enjoy that. Speaking of getting out there and enjoying that, let's take a look outside and let's take a look at the weather. It's going to be a wonderful warm day today. 83 is going to be our high. That's pretty much going to be the high for the rest of the week until we head into the weekend. We still have that monsoonal moisture. We still have the humidity out there, mountain desert uh, thunderstorms. But for us, we're just going to have the warm weather and clouds kind of moving in and out as we've seen for the past few days. You never know. It's going to be cloudy, going to be sunny. It just is kind of a, a luck of the draw. Let's take a look outside, sunrise and sunset. This is a great picture over in Laguna Niguel, over in there, close to their Arboretum. And the sunrise today was 6.03, and the sunset tonight is going to be 7.50. Hey, you want you to send us your photos. You can send us great photos like this one or whatever ones you take around the village area. You can send your name, where you took the photo, and make sure it's a horizontal uh, picture so we can get it on the screen. Email us at lagunawoodsvillagetv at gmail.com. All right, let's take a look at some of the meetings. And when we come back, Bobby Higgins is going to be talking to Dr. Patrick Griffith. Stay with us. Joint care is so exceptional, you'll wish you'd done it sooner. At Memorial Care, we're voted high in patient satisfaction for a reason. Our specialized surgeons and care teams understand the pain you're going through, as well as the best personalized treatment to get you back to what you love sooner. With nationally recognized care, advanced technology like our Precision Mako surgical system, and support that's always by your side. Get ready to go forth with renewed joy. A new movement awaits at Memorial Care Orthopedic and Spine Institute. Welcome back to this day. Joining me now is Dr. Patrick Griffith with Memorial Care Saddleback Medical Center. Thank you for being here today. I know you're a busy, important man, so really appreciate you coming on set. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So wanted to learn a little bit about you and your, your background. Why did you want to become a surgeon? Uh, it started at a very young age. It, it's, it's a story that I don't talk about much. But really, it started with Ben Casey. Probably a lot of people don't know that, but Ben Casey was a neurosurgeon that I really looked up to for multiple reasons. Had uh, the integrity, uh, compassion for what he did, uh, and it was all the things that I aspired to. That was at 12 years old. So ever since I was 12, I knew I wanted to be a surgeon, and it wasn't until I was about 22 that I knew I wanted to do heart and lung surgery. Wow, that's, that's incredible to know that so, at such a young age, yeah. that that's what you wanted to do. What would, what would you say is most meaningful for you, being a surgeon? You know, it, it's transitioned decade to decade, I would say. It, it started off that, uh, to do a, a great operation of seeing people come in with pain or whatever the issues were, and it transitioned and seeing them leave the hospital in, in exceptional condition as best as we could. I still have that focus, but in addition, I look at, well, how did they arrive at the hospital in this condition? So now I focus on and, and committed to, how do we try to prevent 
people from having to come to the hospital. Uh, so there's four major things I always say, you'll hear it a lot, is just the way we eat, exercise, sleep, and meditate. Absolutely, and, and definitely well-rounded. I like that, that it's the whole, not just treating the, the issue or the problem, right. it's the whole. Holistic the whole, approach. Yeah. Uh, so why this specialty? Why mm -hmm. did this speak to you, that this is what you wanted to go into? You know, I, I look at different things. Some people will call it a job. I, I say it's a calling. Uh, strong faith in God, and it was one that I knew as soon as I did it. Uh, there was a, a passion, a commitment that I had. And honestly, it came fairly easy, it seemed. Uh, the understanding. It's still hard work, uh, but I've never been deterred. Uh, so I love it just from the different dynamics of what you're able to do. Yeah. I love that. And so now you've joined Memorial Care, Heart mm -hmm. and Vascular Institute at Saddleback. Yes. So tell me, what are you most excited about in working with them and partnering with them? Yeah, it, it's an organizational fit. It's a matter of what I'm seeing or people have equal and probably even more passion in terms of what they do, uh, as well as a collaborative spirit and, and really put, putting the patient first. So that's why I saw a big difference in terms of wanting to be here versus other areas. Okay. And one of the things about Saddleback is their, their innovation and their comprehensive cardiovascular care. You know, how do you become a leader in this field and continue to be a leader in this field? You know, leadership, most people think of is that it's, it's one person that you can point to, but that's just it. It's not. It's, it's a team. So it's a collaborative effort amongst many, making sure that they have a, a pointed vision. And I know that's what our CEO does. And we all talk about what are the different dynamics we can actually achieve to say that the patient is first in terms of not only just outcomes and quality, but also their experience. And, and so that is really what has made the difference. So leadership really is, is a big team effort. Mm. Definitely takes takes a, a village, right? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so for you specifically, why do patients come to you? So I do a myriad of operations. Uh, I've been in uh, practice, I've been in medicine now for over 40 years. Uh, only heart and lung surgery for over 30 years now, specifically. Uh, my focus is in uh, bypasses, which is where we take vessels of the body to go around blockages of the heart. Uh, valve operations, be it open or minimally invasive type operations, uh, as well as irregular heart rhythm type of operations that are done, uh, and also lung cancer work. So I focused on these things to also become better as time goes on to be able to service the patients. Yeah. So those are probably the areas that most uh, patients see me for. It, it is unbelievable the things that can be done and treated these days. <laughs> yes, and continues to, to grow. And so Saddleback Medical Center, it's a STEMI receiving center. Yes. So explain to me what's a STEMI so receiving center. STEMI, S-T-E-M-I, which is uh, ST elevation, meaning that's the, what we see on an EKG. And when we see those changes, it says there are things going on with the heart. MI means myocardial infarction. So what we are seeing is potential damage to the heart. And we're saying, how do we prevent that? And what we found is that if we can get to that and reverse it within uh, a few hours, it makes a difference to the patient. What we're seeing if we don't get to that is, unfortunately, there's an increased risk of death, as well as if not dying, what we call congestive heart failure. Over the next five years, it's expected that heart failure is going to increase. So we are a center that once someone uh, develops that chest pain and we see that that EKG is changing along with other patterns, we're able to quickly get them uh, the care that they need uh, in the catheterization laboratory and open up that vessel either with a stent or by open surgery. Okay. Yeah, and very important, especially you know, someone who's experiencing a heart attack. I know uh, the emergency uh, department at, at Saddleback um, 
they have uh, emergency treatment times that beat the national average. Yes. So that's obviously something very important as well. Yes, uh, the times continue to come down. Nationally, it used to be 90 minutes, now it's, it's 60 minutes to be able to start reversing. And yes, Saddleback is now uh, exceeding expectations. That's great. Um, and there are, Saddleback's also on the forefront of advanced treatment options. Tell me about that, like with the minimally invasive. Yeah, so a lot of times we have to open up the entire chest to do certain operations. But now uh, our, our teams have developed ways that for a valve, be it the aortic valve, mitral valve, or tricuspid valve, uh, that we're able to go through small incisions that are probably about two inches in size and replace or repair these uh, valves. So previously, like how and where were the incisions? The incision was in the, in the middle of the chest, starting from the top of the breastbone down to the bottom. Wow. So, and now we usually either make a small incision on the side of the chest uh, in different areas to approach the valve that we need to take care of. And this is just, is it new equipment that allows you to do this, or it's just new techniques on how to do the procedures? Right. It's, it's all of the above. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's been in transition and continues to get better as years go on. Wow. So. Uh, who would be a candidate for a minimally invasive um, cardiac surgery? Yeah, most people we will assess at the time, and, and honestly, you'll find that the majority of people may be, uh, but the hesitation is if they have concomitant, meaning other disease at the same time. So if they need a bypass operation as well as a valve operation, they would not. But if they have isolated valve disease, then they would actually be a candidate. And those are things that we would assess at the time of, uh, of seeing For it. each patient. Yes. Yeah, and so basically going back to how can you prevent this? What are the, you know, healthy lifestyle, exercise? How do you know if, say, you're getting enough exercise? Like, mm -hmm. I walk my dog every day. Is that right. enough exercise? Well, again, like, like everything that we do, we have to in some way set a goal uh, I, I would almost say one should be satisfied, but really you shouldn't be satisfied with just reaching a certain level. Uh, the goal is always to try to continue to push yourself just a little bit more uh, so that if you're walking uh, 15 minutes a day, maybe it's, it's time to do 20 minutes a day uh, or 30 minutes a day. Uh, but when you say what is enough is again achieving a goal and vision and saying what is it I really want to do and once you do that the path can be set. There's so many individualities about this that yeah. I could go on for a long time. <laughs> I practice well, this myself. And the heart is a muscle so Absolutely. the more you work it the stronger it gets. Sometimes Absolutely. things will flatten out and then you gotta yeah you gotta up it up to yes. Yeah. continue to get good with it. So okay so and if, uh, if, if anyone wants to make an appointment with you or get a hold of you uh, they can visit the website. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and that is memorialcare.org slash heart. Yes. Or they can give you a call at 949-268-4568. Yes. Best way to get a hold of you and make an appointment. And, and preventative, too, to come in and, and yes. make sure. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to talk more about that in the future because I think that's so important uh, in terms of reversing uh, the process that we see now because it's increased significantly. So heart disease, the risk factors include high blood pressure, cholesterol issues, diabetes, family history, and smoking. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming on today. It was a pleasure thank, to meet you. Thank you very much, Bobby. It was a pleasure. All right. All right. Well, stay with us because we will have more of this day coming up right after this. Beach walkers, grandkid chasers, stair climbers, dance lovers, weekend warriors, and yogis. Your life demands activity, and joint pain shouldn't hold you back. Get personalized joint care that's as unique as you, with high satisfaction rates to prove it. At Memorial Care, your joint replacement patient navigator will be by your side, helping you safely return to more. Like another beach, extra hug, and one more song. More from life is calling with Memorial Care. 
O'Connor Mortuary has been healing hearts, inspiring trust, and comforting souls since 1898. As one of the oldest family-owned and operated mortuaries in California, we are proud to be a long-standing pillar in the community. Our unwavering commitment to providing support in a time of need is what sets us apart and allows us to build strong bonds with each family we serve. Thank you for choosing us for 125 years. We're talking about a tough subject that some people kind of want to avoid, but it's, it's really an important one for us to tackle. It's grief. And uh, for Becky Lamaca is from Okana Mortuary, and she's going to talk to us about the experience that they've certainly learned over the years and what you've kind of gone through in terms of how you've dealt with folks who, who deal with grief. What is kind of maybe, let's get jump right into it. What, what, what is the, one of the big misnomers about how we deal with grief? Well, I think the biggest is that we grieve in stages. Mm -hmm. right? yeah, I've heard I, the, the, the multiple stages of grief, right? Right, right. Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross actually wrote a book back in the 60s on the stages of dying. And over time, it kind of transposed in the, these stages of grief. And that's why if you Google, that's the first thing that you see. And one of the things that we've realized probably over the past 40 years, and even Dr. Kubler-Ross herself saw this, is that grief is much more fluid. It's much more dynamic. Mm -hmm. We don't grieve, uh, we don't yeah. feel anger, and then go into the next stage, and the next stage, the next stage. We feel all of these things. And if people who have experienced grief, they, they know this. You feel all sorts of emotions at all different times. And one of the reasons we don't like to talk about grieving in stages is because we don't want people to feel like they're doing it wrong. Right, like there's like, I've checked that box, I'm done with yeah. this, this sec, now mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on to this one, right? And right. that's kind of a kind of a, uh, I'm, yeah, like you said, I'm doing it wrong. Or I'm, I, is, there, is there a right way? There isn't a right way. And I sure wish, you know, I, I wish we could grieve in stages. And those who are grieving wish we could grieve in stages mm -hmm. because wouldn't that be nice to check all the boxes and then be done with it? Right. And unfortunately, um, that's not what happens. And we grieve how we grieve. Now, you also said one of these stages that we grieve with sec their secondary losses that can mm -hmm. even be more impactful. What do you mean by mm -hmm. that? What is that about? Well, a lot of times we think when we, when we talk about grief, we think about a death loss. And there are many more losses associated with a death loss or maybe not even a death loss that people are experiencing. Um, we grieve if we lose our driver's license. We grieve if we have mobility issues. Um, grieve having to move, maybe leaving our, our home and having to go into an assisted living. Um, grieving kids going off to college well, that's a nesters, big thing right? yeah so okay, yeah so when you're talking about when you say grief you know we think of just someone a death mm -hmm. in the family or a death of a loved one close to us but grief can really apply to a lot of things that we have to say goodbye to or that have come to have sunsetted in our lives absolutely right absolutely and that and i do know that that driver's license issue or you know moving can be really be an impact for mm -hmm. somebody they 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 that, that mobility has been taken away from them that access to the world has been taken away and that is a very real loss i think when there has been a death loss um, people are grieving that death loss and simultaneously they're grieving some of these secondary losses um, I now don't have any, you know, my spouse who died did all of the meals, made all of mm -hmm. the meals, took care of all of the bills, and now I have to figure out how to do this on my own. Mm -hmm. And there are days when you're grieving that secondary loss more than the death, death loss. And I always let people know, that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. It, don't it, feel guilty yeah, about it. Yeah, I was going to say, there's maybe a guilt in like, like, I don't have anybody to cook me a meal. And well, wait, you lost your spouse. Shouldn't that be the focus? And you're like, like we said, there's no right way to do that. Exactly, right. exactly. And there are days that that is going to be the primary focus and your mm -hmm. primary, primary grief and giving yourself that grace to say, it's okay to feel this way mm -hmm. today. There are a mix of emotions that you can feel all at the same time, right? Is it, is it a kind of a strange thing to maybe feel like the, one of the points you make joy and grief at the same time? Yes, and a lot of people, that's a really hard thing because should I laugh? Should I find joy? Um, my, my brother died several years ago, and when the holidays came around, my mom really struggled with 
how can I celebrate and be happy and enjoy time with my grandkids and my family when my son has died? And she, she felt that she needed to stay in this mourning period and could not celebrate and could not, right. um, could not acknowledge those happy things in her lives. And we talked through the fact that we can do both. We, it's not an either or, it's a yes and. You can't stay in that place. It's not, it's not a healthy thing, I would imagine, to stay in that place. My wife passed away, unfortunately, back in 2015. And I remember when we were going through the process of services and those things, we'd, we'd, have, a, we'd have a laugh every once in a while. Like, she would have hated that. You know, we kind of like, what, what would Shannon have said here? What would yeah. she have done here? And we had a laugh, and it felt, it was, it was a lift. It mm -hmm. felt like a relief to just laugh for a minute, yes. you know? And that's kind of a, people have to, I guess, recognize that that's, that's really okay to have that mix of emotions involved in it. And it doesn't mean that you're still not grieving. It right. means that you're beginning to take that person with you on mm -hmm. your grief journey. You're bringing that person along with you in those moments of joy and gratitude. Mm -hmm. One of the things, we, there's no right or wrong way, but there is one thing you should do. You have to go through the grief, right? You can't avoid grief. That's another one of your mm -hmm. points, right? Don't run away from it. Don't try to go around it. You have to go through it. You have to go through it. And um, it's messy. It's hard. Um, I would never pretend that it's easy, mm -hmm. yet what we see time and time and time again is we need to allow ourselves to experience these feelings. We need to go through it. Mm -hmm. um, rather than shutting the door, throwing the covers over our head and pretending like it never happened, mm -hmm. I tell people lean, lean toward people. Set your boundaries, do what you're comfortable with, yet we're also not meant to go it alone. So lean toward people. Um, allow people to be there, not to help you, not to fix you, but simply to be present. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're in that, I mean, like, I, I don't want to feel this way. I want to I stop feeling this way. Isn't that one of the reactions from people? I just don't want to feel this right oh, now. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We don't want to feel this way. Mm -hmm. um, yet we do feel this way. And interestingly, when we lean into it, we, f we feel that dissipate a little bit sooner mm -hmm than when we choose to try to avoid it. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I certainly learned about, I think about grief for myself is, is um, it's not, oh, I'm over it, I'm through it. And my, my mother actually lost her mother at a, at, in the teenage years, and she is almost, she'll be 80 years old this year, and she says, I still miss her every day. So I think it's one of the things you still carry that. It's never a day that goes by where you maybe don't feel that or there's some part of it, but you're still, it's still with you, but it's in it, it doesn't have the intensity of the heaviness mm -hmm. as it started with, yeah. right? And I feel that you know, you, you, you know that better than I do, right? We're all, we're all masters of our own grief, but absolutely, we learn to enfold the loss into our lives. We never recover, we can't go backward, but we learn to move forward with this loss, bringing this person with us, even right. though they're not physically here with us, we continue that connection. And um, over time, those edges of grief soften a little bit, and it's more laughter, less tears. Now, the last point well, you, 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 that you wanted to make sure we understood is although sometimes it may seem impossible, we can actually get through it, right? So at the, at the beginning, it's like, I can't do this, I can't do this, but people get through this, right? We do get through this, and um, st statistically speaking, only about 7% of people throughout the world really get stuck in their grief. Mm -hmm. And there's growth from it too. And there's growth from it. I mean, look at just, think about how many charities have been started in the US that come out of grief. Mm -hmm. You know, I th the first one that comes to my mind is Mothers Against Drunk Driving, right? Right. That is an individual who took her devastating loss in her grief and she grew and she said, here's what I'm gonna do. Here's how I'm going to honor my child. I'm gonna take this grief and I'm going to harness it and I'm gonna create good in the world. Right, things like Race for the Cure, Cancer Walks, yes. Alzheimer's groups and all sorts of things like that come from those people. I, wanted, I need to do something I about this. I need to this. do something. And even if you're not a person who, hey, I'm gonna go start a foundation, I'm gonna start a charity, we still grow through that, right? Mm -hmm. We still learn to incorporate it into our lives and move forward. Right, that's an important thing to understand that, like you said, we get through it and you can grow from that and you can take the, what you've learned from that and actually actually help other people when it comes that time to be that support person as well, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And that's why support groups are so effective, even more than therapy most of the time. It's that, again, that community and just having somebody else who can be there to listen, who doesn't understand your particular grief, but is walking their own journey. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, well, thank you very much. Becky Lamaca from O'Connor Mortuary. That was a great conversation. It's an important one to have. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Where would you go if you could go anywhere? What would you do if you could do anything? How would you fill your days? Who would you spend them with? When you retire, what will you explore? Let us show you how a complete retirement plan can open your world to endless possibilities. Explore your retirement. Okay, we have a few announcements and we're going to check on the weather here before we go on this day. I want to take you out to see the Fab Four. That should be some fun times. Uh, there's going to be a patio concert. Britain's Finest is the name of the uh, tribute group to the Beatles. They're going to be at Clubhouse One on the patio Thursday, August 3rd at 6.30 p.m. Tickets are $18. They are on sale at the Clubhouse office. And they are just really, this is one of these great Fab Four kind of tribute bands. You can call 949-597-4281 or email recreation at vmsinc.org for more information about that show. Also, you want to get out and beat the heat? We've got some movies for you over at the um, Senior Center, the Florence Sylvester Senior Center. They've got movies all through uh, August that are going on. Some really great ones coming up. Um, Eight Below, Steel Magnolias, For Brady was that recent movie with uh, a lot of fun folks in there. The Producers, a classic, The Dig. Imitation Games, a fantastic one about the World War, World War II cracking of the German-British code. Uh, Ray, on, of course, uh, The Laundromat, all sorts of great ones. So make sure you get out there to the Senior Center. You can call 949-380-0155 for more information about movie days and getting out there. It's going to be every Wednesday and Friday is when they're going to be showing the movies in August and September. Then one more really important one that you guys should get out and, and learn a little bit more about. Anatomy of a scam. Uh, seniors are the most targeted communities in terms of scams when you get these scam phone calls or these scam emails or texts that ask you to click on a link, call them, give them information. So these folks are going to be able to come out here. It's presented by the Senior Protection Fast, uh, the program of the Council on Aging, and they have a lot of information about how to recognize these scams, what you can do to protect yourself against these scams. So the date is going to be Wednesday, August 9th. Make sure you get out there, 12:15. It's going to be over at the Senior Center, and uh, make sure you get out there for that. That's a really important one that affects a lot of us here in this community. Okay, let's take a look outside and take a quick look at the weather before we head out. It's going to be 80s all through the week. We have that monsoonal moisture coming up from the south. It's causing some desert uh, thunderstorms and then mountains as well. But for us, it's just going to be humid. It's going to be warm. Clouds coming in and out throughout the days uh, and, uh, you know, rest of the week, really. So that humidity is going to be sticking with us for a while. That's going to do it for this edition of This Day. You can view This Day at 9 a.m., 12.30, and 5 p.m. right here on Village Television. For all of us here at Village TV, hope you make this day a great one.